Now, Phoenix Group is an asset owner and does not have its own in-house asset manager. Instead, we work with a number of third-party asset managers who operate under discrete mandates. This enables us to select the very best in class and work with them to share ideas and develop the leading approach to portfolio decarbonisation. Genuine collaboration in action. I'm therefore delighted to be able to welcome a number of our asset management partners to our first panel event to discuss the work we have been doing together. Joining us today are Clive Emery from Invesco, Jim Barry from BlackRock and Ava Cairns from Aberdeen. As a reminder, there will be an opportunity to ask questions during this panel discussion. You can submit your questions using the Q&A tab below. Let me now hand you over to Sindhu Krishna, Head of Responsible Investments at Phoenix Group, who will chair this panel. Over 13 million customers, north of 300 billion assets under administration. UK's largest long-term savings and retirement business, that's who we are. Helping people secure a life of possibilities. Making a positive contribution to the society for the benefit of customers, shareholders, colleagues and communities is our purpose. Responsible investment is vital to fulfil this objective with climate change and the risks and opportunities associated with it being a key component. Globally, for the world to avert the climate crisis, governments, policy, technology, consumer appetite and business response all need to shift. These are all not directly in our control, but we can influence by playing a leading role in informing the debate and supporting the case for change. We are committed to playing our part. In December 2020, we made a pledge to be net zero within our investment portfolios by 2050. In practice, this includes the following objectives. First, reducing the carbon intensity of our investment portfolio in a way that is consistent with achieving a global net zero goal by 2050. Second, increasing in investments in climate solutions that are needed to meet this goal, such as renewable energy, low carbon buildings and energy efficient technologies. And finally, but most importantly, engaging for change, where we influence the investing companies to transition to a low carbon economy. In this journey, our asset management partners play a crucial role. We work and collaborate with them to deliver on our objectives. I'm delighted to be joined by three of our partners today for this discussion. I have with me in the studio, Clive Emery, Multi-Asset Responsible Investment Manager at Invesco, Jim Barry, Chief Investment Officer of BlackRock Alternative Investors, and Ava Keynes is joining us virtually, and she is the Head of Climate Change Strategy at Aberdeen. I will now invite each of our panelists to briefly introduce themselves and spend about 10 minutes taking us through each of the pillars I described. We will then have a panel discussion on some of the key aspects of decarbonizing investment portfolios, followed by a Q&A. Without further ado, I'll pass it to Clive to take us through the decarbonization of investment portfolios. Clive, over to you. Cindy, thank you very much. And thank you also to the Phoenix Group, both for their leadership in this crucial area um, of industrial change but also for being one of the major clients and customers that is driving this change. Uh, I think it's crucial for us and for the industry, so thank you. When we talk about the big policy announcements and, and, and the comments we've just heard from Make My Money Matters of the potential impact that your money can have, we then need to put it into practice and how do we actually bring that to bear in real world portfolios? Uh, and the slide you'll see on screen is, is indicate, an indicative that just integrating ESG into a portfolio doesn't really deliver what is a net zero commitment. And simply reducing carbon is also not just a net zero commitment. In fact, a new and additional framework is required. 
And that is required because we are aiming to reduce real world emissions. Now the problem is, is you can create an investment portfolio that doesn't invest in oil and gas and state that your fund is down 30, 40, 50% in carbon emissions. That is the exposure of a portfolio. It is not a real world reduction. And reducing real world emissions is the key to this campaign and this key to this focus that we must bring to bear. And so ensuring that portfolios are aligned to deliver what we call transition rather than exclusion is crucial. And that means working with companies to try to get them on the pathway. As your CEO mentioned just a few minutes ago, only around about 5% of companies have committed with, with real plans to deliver on this. So how do we get the 95% of the rest of the world committed to moving along net zero? Because we can't just invest in the 5% and hope that the 95% will move with us. It really is about engagement with those companies. So the first component here is to reduce emissions from assets. And, and that is to help companies get on board with moving to net zero. The second component is to increase investments in climate solutions. And when I first saw this, I thought that meant I had to invest in individual wind farms. But actually, it, it's more sensible than that, thankfully. It is about investing in companies where their exposure to climate solutions are increasing. So that might be Volkswagen who are increasing their exposure to electronic vehicles. If their percentage of their exposure is increasing over time, that is a good thing and to be commended. And we can monitor that at portfolios to see how the climate solution pledges are going. But what we see is that this framework that is aiming to achieve these objectives it is basically requ requires the industry to think in a third dimension. Now, the industry has focused on risk and reward, hundreds of years, to deliver a return. However, what we are now being asked as an industry is to deliver on a third dimension, in this case, for carbon and carbon reduction. And I can tell you that the financial industry is highly developed, highly sophisticated, uh, and it is very sophisticated in delivering risk and return. It's less sophisticated in delivering carbon reduction at a portfolio level because it's not something the industry has focused on for decades. Now the good news is, is the industry is getting its act together and is focusing on these arenas. And one of the key things to deliver is that we must firstly set specific targets for, for, for portfolios, 50% um, you know, reduction, by 2030 uh, and further than that uh, for, for, for Phoenix, uh, we're looking at the 25% reduction by 25. But in addition, what we must do is align all issuers to net zero. Now, that is not an easy job. That requires us to look at every company that we invest in and align them this, to this spectrum, this multicolored spectrum you see in front of, which you saw on the previous slide, which is now being shown again. And we must align, how, how do we judge a company? Where are they on this spectrum? And then within the portfolio, once you've set those, those criteria, which are not easy to set, you then must make a commitment to increase the percentage you invest in your portfolio to the right-hand side, to invest in companies that are increasingly aligning. It isn't to exclude those not aligned today. It is to ensure that the companies we invest in are on this, you know, alignment, this pathway, uh, and that we work in partnership with them to deliver that. And then at a portfolio level, we're there to increase exposure along this maturity and to invest in companies with increasing climate solutions. With the aim that then portfolio carbon emissions will be lower. And then the last component of this is to commit to engagement. You know, we must be speaking to companies you know, we've spent you know, decades just valuing equities and credits to, to ensure that the, the investments we make go up in value. What we're now having to do is align that to that third dimension. And to do that, we're becoming engaged stakeholders with companies and with our clients to deliver for this positive outcome. One of the components of this, though, is we're having to forecast into the future. What might a company do? 
How might a company be able to deliver positive outcomes and positive climate reduction? That is not a skill set. I mean, the industry is focused on, on growing earnings. This is a new analytical framework. It requires new data systems, new routes to analysis. The data quality is patchy. The standardization of the data is different. And a lot of these developments are being made as we speak. And fortunately, the collaboration that Phoenix talk about is something that I can only confirm it is continuing to develop. And it, the amazing collaboration between regulators, governments, the industry, investors, is, is phenomenal to be part of because people are fully aligned in trying to deliver these engagements. Some, like Phoenix, more than others. But the way that the industry is, is collectively trying to engage to deliver for this crucial endeavor uh, is, 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 is heartening and inspiring. What I'd like to talk about is, is some of the takeaways um, that I have you know, reviewed that I think is, is easy to share with you. And the first takeaway is that net zero you know, is focused on this transition. It's not just about excluding you know, the high emitting sectors. It is about including them and getting them to deliver as well. We are all on the same journey. We all live on the planet. The second component is that net zero is moving us into this third dimension. And this is the third dimension for the industry to tackle. How do we align our focus on carbon as well as financial returns and the risk of our investments? And the third com component of takeaway is that net zero is complex. Um, you know, I presented recently to, to our senior leaders in the firm. It was an hour and a half presentation of what a net zero framework is. Uh, I'm trying to condense this into five or six minutes, so apologies for, for a little bit lack of the detail. But it is very complex and requires a, a binding science-based investment framework. And that is crucial, uh, and I, I, I'm aware of Phoenix aligning to science-based transition pathways, which we endorse as well. Uh, and aligning ourselves to the science um, is crucial. And then my last takeaway is that this is a major change for our industry. You know, we are moving from being just asset managers where we value businesses to try to deliver excess return, to being engaged stakeholders to deliver returns, because that remains crucial for people's futures, but also to do so with carbon uh, alignment. Uh, and there are a number of challenges that come into that, which I would include that the investment industry is a part of the puzzle. Well, we are here to work with our clients, with regulators, with the industry, to be able to bring this collectively. I don't think asset managers on their own will be able to deliver this change. Customers need to move their monies. There needs to be client demand. We need, at the moment, I think only 10% of assets in the UK are aligned to sustainable or responsible investing plans. It needs to be 90. So people need, like Richard Curtis indicated, to, to you know, move their money, to, 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 to invest with their heart as well as their mouth and actually force change, force demand. And what we also need to see is an expectation for the industry that isn't overstated. Um, the industry you know, is a part of the puzzle, and if the expectations are that we will solve all of the world's ills, I can guarantee you we will fail, and we will fail in everyone's expectations. What we need is the client expectations of what we can deliver to be matched to the abilities that we can bring to bear. But fortunately, the collaboration and being here with Phoenix today uh, you know, is an indication to me, and I hope to you, of the seriousness that our industry is taking in this in in incredibly important endeavour. Thank you very much, Clive, uh, and absolutely for stressing the need to, to focus on real world change, to look into the future and not merely at, at carbon movement from a backward, from a historical perspective. We'll now move to the second pillar, which is climate solutions, and I'll now pass on to Clive for him to share his thoughts. Clive. And even Jim, sorry, Jim my sorry, response. Jim, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Jim, over Gr to you, great sorry. to be here with you today. And look, uh, you know, picking up on Andy's comments uh, at the opening, you know, addressing this issue will require real collaboration and partnership. And certainly as BlackRock, we're thrilled to be in partnership with Phoenix on this journey. 
So um, let me just uh, bring you through a number of slides uh, to put solutions in context. And I'm going to start with just the scale of the challenge. And what you see in the data represented on the left there um, is the scale of the challenge. Why are we going to take this challenge? Because the economic cost of not doing this is enormous, uh, estimated up to 25% of potential economic output. And I would say to you that underestimates because in a lot of those calculations it underestimates the impact of dynamics like migration um, uh, which can be enormously uh, destructive to economic activity. Um, but I think what I would highlight because I think most people get that there's a real scale of transition. It's also the pace of transition. And I think it's unprecedented in the context of the global economy. And, and I think it's also one of these things where the instinctive nature of most actors, corporates, financial and others, is to delay action, to know more, um, delay regulation and policy. But that's not going to work here because the Climate is already changing. Uh, IPCC says we've already embedded at least one and a half degrees centigrade of climate change. So that cost is there and it's going to grow greater and delaying is only going to increase the cost and pain of transition. Um, we're talking about needing to over double the investment in transition from about $2 trillion to close to $5 trillion uh, over the coming couple of decades. Uh, and that's just enormous its implications. But what I would say from a positive perspective is that we've seen a dramatic increase in momentum over the last two to three years. And there's no question, I think, that fact that we're now experiencing the cost of climate change in our normal everyday life. I think it's no longer sort of 50 and 100 years away. It's no longer islands in the Pacific. It's come home in the dramatic weather and climate events we're now all experienced with consequences of life and, uh, and property. Um, and I think that that is really shifting the politics and the policy. Um, and it's fantastic that COP26 is coming around at this moment. And I, you know, as we went into this extraordinary 18 months um, with the global COVID pandemic, there was a question mark in my mind whether we'd see dynamics like we saw at the, in the global financial crisis, where actually, you know, addressing climate was de-emphasized. There was a sense of there's more important things to do. And I think we've seen quite the opposite over the last 18 months, two years. I think the fact that the virus was exogenous to our financial and economic systems, yet had such an existential um, uh, uh, risk. I think has just emphasized the, the, the importance of something like climate, which is ultimately multiples of its potential economic impact uh, or of the pandemic's economic impact. And I think that that momentum is going to carry into Glasgow in a couple of weeks. And look, you know, the slide on the right captures sort of elements of momentum. I think Clive touched on corporates. There's a hell of a lot more to do there. Um, and, uh, but clearly governments are, are, are taking action. Um, and, you know, I think we'll continue to see momentum uh, on all that front. But don't underestimate consumers in the mix here. We're definitely seeing uh, consumers take action to drive um, uh, uh, changes in behavior um, of companies. And that influences obviously the ones who face the consumer directly, but over time will impact all the value and supply chains. And then finally, I come to capital, um, you know, and, you know, we're talking about over almost $40 trillion of, of institutions with capital have made commitments to net zero. Um, you know, there have been challenges um, posed to uh, the financial community about whether, in particular, you know, kind of large-scale asset management can make a difference. I'm telling you, it has to make a difference, and it will make a difference, and frankly, I'm already seeing it make a difference. And at BlackRock, we're looking to take a lead there because we believe it's in our client interest. We believe it's our fiduciary responsibility to work with our clients around both the uh, risks and opportunities uh, of climate change. And so if you take anything away from this context, um, is that this impacts um, everyone. The next slide has a pile of detail, but let me just frame it. We have a challenge here. There isn't a roadmap we can take off the shelf to say, here's how we get to net zero. Doesn't matter whether you're a country, doesn't matter whether you're a company, whether you're a capital provider. And that's a massive challenge. And it's going to vary dramatically depending on 
who you are and where you are. And I think that, uh, and we have solutions we need that don't exist yet. And so, you know, into that mix, um, policymakers have to look to give direction. Um, we saw the announcement from the UK government overnight, all positive, but there's more needs to be done because if the capital is going to flow, it needs to have a regulatory and policy context. Um, so there's a degree of certainty around return. The capital is not looking for a free ride here, but it needs to have, because of its fiduciary responsibility, a clear context, particularly on risk it needs to take. At BlackRock, we've developed obviously a range of different um, strategies to play into this, obviously on the infrastructure spectrum with renewable power, um, but also now launched a partnership with Tomasek around decarbonization technologies, growth equity into you know, developing some of these solutions. Uh, looking to deal with the challenge of emerging markets. Um, our chairman and chief executive, Larry Fink, has spoken about this quite clearly. We are going to have to transfer substantial amounts of capital from the developed world to the developing world to help them address this challenge. Uh, we have a partnership with the French and German governments and other institutions um, with a fund for emerging markets with sort of catalytic capital to provide a sort of first loss protection for more general institutional capital. But it's going to require innovation like that on the capital side um, uh, to get the capital flowing at scale. This slide does capture some of the major categories. I think just to pick on some here, you know, we do need to clean up energy, uh, no question. Electrif the, the sort of decarbonization of electrification of power generation is, is right at the top of the agenda. And the great news is we have the technologies. The investment over the last 20 and 30 years in things like onshore and offshore wind and solar photovoltaic have transformed the cost economics in a way that they produce, even before you take the price of carbon into account uh, in most areas of the world now, the cheapest electricity. Not without its challenges on a grid because of its intermittent nature. And you know we will need other solutions in the mix there. Uh, certainly, um, as we think about um, uh, heat, as we think about certain elements of transportation, an area like hydrogen um, is getting a lot of focus, and I think that it's one of the areas we'll see a lot of investment. Mobility will electrify. Um, this slide here talks about 58% new vehicles being electric by 2040. I think that's way underestimated. We think too much in straight lines, okay? Uh, think go back to the iPhone. It changed life dramatically in the space of a small number of years. It will take longer with electric vehicles, but by 2040, we will all be driving electric. Um, electrification of mobility is one of the easiest and cost of, most cost-effective ways with proven technology we have to decarbonize our global economy. You look across the rest of the categories, there's work required everywhere. And certainly there are challenges in the mix. Um, uh, you know, decarbonizing agriculture, decarbonizing industrial processes. Uh, we talk here of 75% of steel production to be decarbonized. These are difficult solutions, but what we have is huge um, deployment of capital to come up with innovative solutions around these. And, and we'll see that play out over, over the coming years. Um, and the, the final point I'd make, um, uh, you know, kind of on this side, is, uh, as Clive said, this is a transition. And we need to be very careful not falling into a world of black and white, green and brown, good and bad. Um, we will need a range of technologies, including a, a lot of existing technologies that do emit carbon to transition us. Um, we're seeing already uh, this uh, approaching winter some of the challenges in the power generation space and the challenges we have with natural gas. And so uh, I do think we have to be very careful here that as we transition, we don't create supply demand dislocations in certain areas that increase costs dramatically and potentially work against social acceptance of the transition that's required. But then I would say to you as an alternative asset investment investor, a private market investor, you've got to come up with some framework to deal with this. And certainly at BlackRock, um, uh, that's how we're focused. So the first is to understand. Um, we need to understand the risks and opportunities that they play out in our portfolio and in terms of new capital investment. 
And I think you also have to add in here the fact that we do have this embedded cost of climate change. And particularly for an institution like ours with substantial tens and tens of billions of dollars of real assets, um, there is risk there. And it's not just the immediate risk, the physical risk to your assets, it's the referred risk. If you look at the implications of Hurricane Ida in Louisiana um, uh, only uh, uh, six or seven weeks ago now, um, the, the, the true cost there was the disruption to the grid and power that ultimately shut down a substance of the US's um, petrochemical um, uh, infrastructure uh, with costs measured in tens and tens of billions of dollars. So this is something you need to understand. You then need to manage that. Um, you need to have very clear policies in place with respect to doing that. We've just instituted a, a heightened scrutiny framework um, across the firm um, as we look at um, where we have carbon exposure in particular. Um, uh, you know, people ask what keeps me awake at night. Uh, what keeps me awake at night is where we have carbon exposure that we might end up with stranded assets. Um, uh, it's one thing to underwrite something today, but in 10 years time, can I sell an asset? So these are key things and dynamics to be managed. And finally, you need to engage. And certainly, we as BlackRock are very focused on engaging with our clients like Phoenix, and more generally, um, as a leader in asset management, as a leader in alls, with a view to sort of walking down this road, this journey um, uh, with our clients, and helping um, regula re regulators, policymakers, governments address some of these issues. So with that, Sindhu, Back to you. Thank you very much, Jim, and for, the, for drawing the focus on the need for innovation in, in capital flow as well. So I'll now pass on to Eva to take us through the importance of stewardship and engaging for change. Eva, over to you, please. Thank you, Sindhu, and hello, everyone. And uh, a shame I cannot be with you in the studio today. That would have been nice, but I was fortunately unable to travel down to London from Edinburgh. So I'll have to join you virtually, but very delighted to be talking about the important role of active ownership um, and stewardship in the, in the journey to net zero. Um, Clive uh, also mentioned this earlier, um, and so did Jim, around the importance of engaging for real world impact. And obviously the core theme is around real world impact. Um, and the, the, the importance of uh, engagement is also reflected in the number of industry best practice frameworks, whether we look to the net zero investment framework that was developed by the Institutional Investors Group on Climate Change or the net zero asset owners target setting protocol. It is recognised that to really achieve that transition, you cannot simply just drop the companies that are carbon intensive today, but really focus on increasing the proportion of companies that are aligned to net zero goals and using engagement and a wider stewardship such as voting as an important tool. So what I wanted to talk about today is a little bit about the who and the what and the how when it comes to developing an engagement strategy for net zero. Because I think what is really key is that it's not just a high level statement we engage for net zero, but really has got that detail behind it so that you have um, processes in place to measure and monitor the progress and can therefore take actions when there's insufficient progress. So what you see here is just a slide that talks through four steps I wanted to bring to life a little bit. The first one is identifying the priorities for engagement. So obviously you've got large carbon emitters, but um, what is important to do is identify the largest financed emitters. So actually bring in also the exposure and the ownership, for example, in the equity space into play and looking at how much, uh, what are the highest financed emitters in the portfolio. So in a nutshell, where you uh, own 5% of a company, you own 5% of their emissions and looking at the highest emitters in that way can help um, create a starting point for identifying your priorities for engagement. However, mostly this is done on scope one and two emissions. And so the, the direct um, operational emissions uh, of the company and scope three is not um, incorporated and uh, there is data challenges around that scope free. So we need to think a bit broader than that and actually identify other areas and sectors where we might want to have focused engagement priorities, such as banks, financial industries, for example, where you will not easily identify them as you know carbon intensive companies, but obviously what is done through their um, investments and lending and so on is absolutely critical. 
So the first step, identifying that priority list. Um, secondly, assessing, and Clive talked about that as well, their transition alignment. So are they actually already leaders in that space? Maybe they have set a net zero 2050 goal, but don't have the necessarily action plans in place to support, um, to provide the evidence on how they will achieve that. Or maybe they are just at the start of the journey um, and then maybe the laggards and they're not even disclosing their emissions yet. So that transition assessment of where a company is at through active research, but also through bringing in some externally available tools. And I'll talk about that a bit later towards the, the end of my slot, um, such as the Climate Action 100 plus Net Zero Benchmark and the TPI score. Now, there's an error on the slide here. It's the Transition Pathway Initiative score that I'm talking about. So I'll talk about that later. But this active research and using externally available data to ultimately have a view of how are these companies that are your highest financed emitters positioned when it comes to the net zero transition? What targets do they have, for example, and strategies? And then engaging, engaging with a focus on identifying these key priorities for the relevant companies, the key outcomes, they need to be time bound um, with a real, uh, uh, you know, a clearly setting out the expectations and engaging um, in a variety of ways individually by sending, for example, letters through um, voting and AGM attendance. All of these are different tools that can be used here to help drive action, as well as collaborative engagement. So we mentioned Climate Action 100 Plus earlier, um, and I was just going to bring up a couple of examples here because we've also been involved with Climate Action 100 Plus and leading, for example, on a company like E.ON since the inception of Climate Action 100 Plus. And through that ongoing collaborative engagement and continuing to lay out expectation, whether that is TCFD reporting initially um, and then more detail and scenario analysis, climate ambition, you can really see how the company is responding and stepping up their disclosures, stepping up their targets, um, which, de which demonstrates that there is po progress in the right direction. We've definitely seen that with Eon, who joined the business ambition for one and a half degrees this year, for example. Another example is BP, where we actually joined with a, a group of eight Climate Action 100 plus investors in 2019 to attend the AGM and make statements on different topics to really push them um, towards a, a much more ambitious net zero strategy that includes scope three. Um, and again, we've seen quite a big change in the company. So these are things where we feel they have a positive impact and as large asset managers, we can really push the dial in the right direction through those. Um, and then the last one, monitoring progress. So as I said, having those clear milestones over time and providing transparency externally as well on the engagements that have taken place, what was discussed, the expectations that were laid out and reviewing this on a regular basis to consider whether um, that we see sufficient response and whether we are seeing the companies moving from disclosing to then setting out a goal to actually really putting that goal into practice um, with some real action behind it, such as CapEx plans reflecting um, the achievement uh, of, the, of the set targets or management remuneration, for example. So on the next slide, there's just a little bit more detail on how we think about that transition assessment. And the first step, as I said, the exposure of where a company is, and we would normally look at, and this is a very simplified view, um, the emission data, scope one and two, but also scope three, very importantly, the supply chain and the downstream emissions, and understand the transition risks. Um, Jim talked about stranded asset risks there, but the transition risks overall that the company is exposed to. So that emissions data, but we also undertake climate scenario analysis to bring that forward looking view into it and understand how would asset values be impacted today under certain scenarios. And then the ambitions. So how ambitious are the goals and targets? Where do the where do the companies want to go? What targets have they set? Does it cover the relevant emissions that are material to them? And is this reflected in more shorter term targets? Um, and does it cover intensity in absolute, for example? So a number of tools are out there that help provide a view um, in addition to our active research on these um, on these points. And then finally, the credibility. So how will they really get there and have they got credible plans in place? Um, I already mentioned the management remuneration. We can look at their lobbying and whether that is aligned with their 
uh, with their climate strategy. Um, and that ultimately helps us identify the transition leaders and laggards and the focus areas for our engagement with those companies. So I was going to highlight a couple of um, tools. So on the next slide, we see just a view from the state of the transition report by the Transition Pathway Initiative this year. And it also highlights, you see green, uh, this is an assessment of for the highest emitting um, sectors, whether the, the companies and the targets are considered aligned with the um, Paris Agreement. So green below two degrees, yellow two degrees, orange Paris pledges, red not aligned, and um, grey no disclosure. So this is a useful tool to look at firstly understand that there really is differences across sectors that we need to understand. So the active ownership and engagement approach need to, needs to reflect that as well. What are te the technologies available to decarbonize? What are the costs? Um, what are the options and where is the industry at when it comes to innovation? And really trying to push that in the right direction and identify the transition leaders within these sectors, which might still be quite carbon intensive because of the nature of the sector, but actually going in the right direction. So this is an important um, consideration at sector level. And the final slide I have um, and the tool I wanted to highlight is the Climate Action 100 plus net zero benchmark. And this is a really useful input to corporate engagement and monitoring progress. So this is a, a benchmark that was published this year for the first time in March um, and is also uh, done by the Transition Pathway Initiative um, and, uh, and looks at 10 different indicators and assesses the companies, the most carbon intensive companies across these indicators. Firstly, on whether they are net zero aligned, whether they have long term, medium term and short term targets, that's the first four and then how they reflect that in their decarbonisation strategy and their capital allocation alignment. Um, and then it moves on to climate policy engagement and lobbying, climate governance, just transition and TCFD aligned disclosure. So it's really useful because this is going to be done on an annual basis to see how these scores change for a company and that can be used for engagement, but also used to monitor how the company is changing using some of these external tools. So uh, what is really critical is that transparency, I think, and that there is actually, as I said at the start, this time by point and that there are consequences when there is insufficient progress. So again, moving to some of the best practice frameworks, it suggests that you, for example, have a two year time frame and you set very clear expectations for those two years and you need to see companies moving in the right direction. So just to reiterate what some of the other speakers said as well, it is not just about removing the carbon intensive companies or those that are not aligned to net zero goals today yet from the portfolio. It is supporting them and pushing them in the right direction of the transition to net zero and for that to be a core strategy, a core part of a net zero investment strategy. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish on that note, Sindhu. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eva. With that, we will now move on to our panel discussion. So I'll start with opening the first questions to, to our panelists today. We've talked a lot about the COP. A strong, stable policy, global policy, is necessary for a low carbon transition and alignment of portfolios to net zero. The COP next month is a critical moment when governments around the world will set their policy goals and plans. I'd like to open a question on how the panelists see or what is the expectations from the COP especially to accelerate private finance at scale. Eva, if okay, I'll start with you and then move to the panelists in the studio. Yes, absolutely. Happy to take that question. So we need to look at obviously COP26, all eyes on COP26 and expectations are very high, well, uh, for a number of reasons. At the moment, the state of play, we've talked earlier about the need to reduce emissions by 50% by 2030 to be on that 1.5 degree trajectory. And this year, the challenge was that um, all nations were to update the nationally determined contributions, so the pledges towards the Paris Agreement. Um, and the, the, some of the pledges were updated around 120, I think, out of uh, 190 at this stage. But when we look at actually the emissions that come out of all those pledges and um, the updated national determined contributions, we expect to see an increase in emissions of 16% by 2030. 
not very far from a drop um, by 2050. So for investors, this is significant because, you know, you try to decarbonize, obviously contribute to real world decarbonization, but also track the carbon in your portfolios and have set decarbonization goals. And then the policy alignment just really needs to be there to enable that. There will eventually be that roadblock um, of not enable, enabling capital allocation in line with net zero in a financially viable way without the necessary policy incentives to, to do that. So there is this big ambition gap at the moment, and there's also an implementation gap. So where we have seen countries set net zero goals or high level ambitions, this is not yet translated into practice, into policies, into carbon prices. You know, one we believe one of the most effective mechanisms to really get us to decarbonize, to have um, a carbon price um, that reflects the level that is required, um, around seventy-five dollars per ton of carbon, as in, indicated by the um, IMF, for example. So at the moment, only around twenty percent of emissions globally have a carbon price attached to them. So that is a big challenge to put the pledges into practice with the right policies. And as global investors, we look at different regions, they have different policies. So that provides a challenge, particularly with the need to invest um, a lot in emerging markets. And I think that's the next challenge for, for COP. There is the climate finance promise to help mitigation and adaptation in in the developing world by providing um, 100 billion dollars a year of finance from the developed world to the developing world and that promise has not been has not been met um, and a significant amount of finance needs to flow into emerging markets to help with the energy transition which is where we will see large energy growth um, growth in energy demand growth in population and so therefore that is another thing that needs to be tackled so as I say, the expectations are very high and it's the pace that is critical. So the scale of change that's needed across all the different areas. Um, and we have seen from a number of reports this year, whether it's the IPCC report highlighting code red for humanity and that 1.5 degrees is slipping beyond reach, but also the recent um, IEA World Energy Outlook that has highlighted what is needed to invest in decarbonizing the electricity mix, for example, reducing methane emissions, um, but also the investment in clean energy uh, innovation. Uh, that is really key because there's only so far we can go up to 2030. And beyond that, really a lot of the technologies that are needed to decarbonize by 2050 uh, the report says that 50% of them are in prototype or demonstration stage. So we really need that investment in innovation. So quite a lot to be achieved at COP. And I think really quite important that this all lines up in the longer and the medium to longer term. So investors can meet their goals of net zero aligned investment strategies. Thank you very much for your thoughts, Eva, Jim, Clive. Would one of you want to come in on that point? Yeah, no, I think uh, Grace answer by Eva there. I think, look, we want to be careful not to have too high an expectation. Um, uh, I think we're on a journey here, and I genuinely believe with sort of over almost 25 years now investing in the sort of the, 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 the climate space, uh, I do think we've hit an inflection point, no question, in the last two to three years. And we tend to forecast in a very straight line way. I think it's just our nature. And this is not going to be a straight line. And I think that the exponential shift is there, and I think a lot of different dynamics will drive it, of which policy is critical. But I don't think we're going to come out with you know, the silver bullet, the, the one roadmap out of COP26. I think what we will see is you know, really broad acceptance of the challenge. I think there'll be a lot of to-dos. I think there are challenges in the mix. I think that you know, the, there's two elephants in the room. It's China and the United States who have a tense relationship at the moment. But this is an area for key cooperation. I think it'll be interesting what progress is made there. I think from a capital perspective, we're not going to see clear answers across the board at all. But I think that you will see private capital and the public sector and policymakers playing into cooperation and partnership to come up with some of these answers. Eva mentioned the challenge of emerging markets. I touched on it earlier, a huge challenge in the overall mix. But before we even get to emerging markets, 
you know, there are real challenges in developed markets. And I think there are proven technologies, proven solutions where they just need to be enabled more to make them more addressable at more scale. Um, but I think there is that innovation capital is also required. There's no question there are solutions we don't have today we need at scale if we're going to hit our targets. But overall, you know, this is coming to my mind at a really good point in terms of pulling all this momentum together. And I think while, you know, kind of um, we may not see any, you know, blinding statement like we had out of Paris with the Paris Protocol, I think in general we'll be very positive after the event. Thank you very much for your insight, Jim. So we'll move to the, to the next question, to the next panel discussion point. Um, aligning investment portfolios to net zero should be a financially attractive route if you think about it, we're improving portfolio resilience, addressing the risks and seeking opportunities in the context of a big societal shift. This should be the right thing to do from a fiduciary perspective, but has the case been sufficiently made or we need to do more? Clive, if okay, I'll come to you first on this, given especially you made the point of the shift from a two-dimensional investing to three-dimensional investing. Your thoughts here, please. I think this is a most huge and fundamental issue. At present, the fiduciary duty is to deliver financial returns, pure and simple. And there is even legislation in the US that enforces that under ERISA regulations. If we are moving to a world where because of the difficulties of regulating the global industries to align to net zero, that one of the mechanisms we're going to do is use the capital markets, asset owners, banks, and asset managers to enforce net zero, rightly so. There is a real issue because you know, that is our influence onto authorities. But one of the problems we see is the fiduciary duty is financial. There probably needs to be a new approach to fiduciary duty. That when you talk about the benefits, as Richard Curtis said, no point giving you a pension if the world's on fire. So what are the benefits that your pension should be giving you and should there be an additional fiduciary duty along that third dimension for net zero? My view is it should be. And in terms of COP, you know, changing the fiduciary duty or helping that in a regulated manner at a macro level, I think would be phenomenally supportive. And on a micro level in the UK, you know, to ensure greater asset shift, you know, we currently incentivize investments through ISAs. I loved one of the policies, I can't remember who bought, that bought it up, but has been campaigning to make all ISAs net zero compliant, to force capital into these vehicles. So if the government's going to provide you with taxable benefits, why don't we taxable in the right direction? So on a micro basis and on a macro basis, I think that fiduciary responsibility is a key and crucial change. It's quite controversial because we still need to deliver financial returns. I don't believe, as your question asks, that we should be delivering the third dimension at necessarily the expense. My view is on a 30-year business, in a 30-year view, investing in companies that are sustainable and will be here in 30 years is going to deliver excess returns. It might not do it on a one-year view or a two-day view or a six-month view, but what that is doing is enforcing us back, thankfully, to long-term investing. And I think that, you know, the industry has been criticised many times for short-termism. I think net zero provides an opportunity for greater long-term investing with greater fiduciary duties. Thank you very much, Clive. Jim, I don't yeah, know. I was going to say, look, I mean, I'm CIO of a $320 billion alternative asset business. And to my mind, and let me broaden it out to actually ESG more broadly. Um, you know, and I have investors who've been around a long time and who think in a certain way. But... To my mind, it is actually a fiduciary risk, okay? As I think about any of these criteria, climate and net zero the, at, at the forefront, it's a risk that's either being priced today or tomorrow. And I think that, you know, to your point, I absolutely agree, you may not see it in the short term, but ultimately these are risks, whether it's environmental, as we're talking about today, social or governance, that has a financial cost at the end of the day. And so if I'm investing today in an asset with carbon exposure, I can no longer look at the economic life of that asset and expect to make a return because something's going to change in the next 10, 20, or even 30 years as we drive to net zero. 
And so, and I think, I think the challenge is, um, you know, kind of as a fiduciary, that's why we've taken the lead. In other words, this is, it's not about doing good, it's about actually making the return over the long term for investors. And so, um, you know, and I think this will be borne out. Absolutely. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your thoughts there, Jim. So moving on, um, capital flow to support transition is vital. Various think tanks, um, Jim, you mentioned that as well in your, in your uh, note about trillions being required to, to, get, uh, to help to get there. At the same time, we talk about green bubble. Too much money chasing too few investable assets. Where does the truth lie or where, do you, where is the balance? How do you see this? Um, Jim, if I can start with you, please, on this one. Well, as an investor, I'm always concerned about bubbles. Uh, supply demand is the best lesson anyone will ever learn. Um, look, I would say to you that there is a challenge because capital is beginning to move. Um, our clients, like Phoenix, are, are looking to deploy uh, into uh, the space. Um, but I think that the, you're kind of, we will see uh, an addressable response. We're seeing corporates, as we've all touched on, adapt and begin to commit to net zero pathways. Um, we're seeing policy, like was announced by the British government overnight, that is looking to create new addressable opportunities. I think you will, in the mix of that, have pinch points where you know, the addressable assets against the capital available um, you know, drives returns down. I think then it becomes a question, and we've seen that in the area of renewable power infrastructure over the last you know, seven years in particular, um, is the return still attractive as against you know, the other options available. And I would say to you, frankly, it still is uh, in a lot of cases. And so, but something we always have to be sensitive to, no question. Sure. Clive, yeah, do you, you want to give us your thoughts on that? We've seen over the last few years in certain stocks, significant valuation increases relative to peers because of their perceived excellence. Well, clearly, as the other industry leaders see that, they're going to follow suit and there's going to be an imbalance. So. You know, markets are, are, are not perfect, but they do price. And the reality is, is that you know, we don't necessarily invest statically. The key is to be able to, to, to move with those valuation disparities. It isn't just about putting your money somewhere and hoping it'll, it'll be great in 15 years. Because we have seen significant valuation premiums. And those are the opportunities then to, to exit and then to basically come in. But if we see the, the, the passive growth in the industry in regards to sort of, you know, certain segments of the market, so hydroelectric power or solar, and then those vehicles attract a huge amount of capital flow, and there's only a small amount of investable companies, well, as Jim said, supply and demand is pretty obvious. And those that, I'm more concerned about the asset flow creating asset bubbles, but the benefit of net zero, because of its transition focus, is bringing all of us. So there isn't this view that we should only invest in the certain excellent parts. Now, clearly we want to add extra capital to those parts of the economy, but we shouldn't have all of the asset flow to those parts. It should be helping uh, all industries on that transition pathway, the aggressive alignment uh, to, to those sort of the 2050 uh, net zero commitments. Thank you very much for your, for your thoughts on that. Um, I'm seeing a few questions feed in, so I'll probably start, uh, take a couple of questions from the audience before, before we draw close. Um, the first one, I think, uh, Eva, this, this may be one relevant to yourself. Uh, to achieve uh, net zero, should one divest from fossil fuel extractors, stocks and bonds? Hmm. Well, I think that's exactly the point that I was talking about earlier when it comes to active ownership. And this is a really challenging topic because a lot of people think fossil fuels really shouldn't, you know, be part uh, maybe of a climate focused portfolio. And some clients indeed will want to exclude it. However, when we think about the principle of real world transition and decarbonisation, and we think about the industries we need in 2050 and the energy we need, then the fossil fuel players today they are core to that transition. Um, so this is a really challenging kind of part that goes back to the question, what is a net zero aligned portfolio? What is a Paris aligned portfolio? Which industries should be included right up front? And actually you'll look at some fossil fuel players today that we think will be one of the largest um, global renewable energy players that are investing so heavily. So if you take a forward looking view on those, 
then actually, yes, they should be part of that portfolio. And so it's, again, as we said earlier, not as black and white as that, but we need to take a, a, a forward-looking view um, and understand what is the impact of divesting versus keeping in the portfolio with a forward-looking view on the, the, the real-world transition to net zero. I think that's the key question. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Eva. Um, there's another question. The planet will hopefully be the winner from this agenda. Uh, what sacrifices will investors, businesses and society have to make to help the planet win? Any, Jim, Clive, well, any studio? I, I hate to tell you, but the planet's going to be around for a long, long time. I think this is more about us as a species, whether we're going to be on the planet living productively. Um, and a lot of other species as well, I might quickly add. I think, look, the, again, it comes back to are we making a trade-off or not? Um, and, and my belief is there's an externality that is driving climate change. It's called carbon dioxide and its equivalents. And what we need to do is price that externality. You price that externality in very clear frameworks, and it will drive the transitions that's necessary. The other thing I would say, too, is that there's potential huge opportunities in this transition to address other key societal needs as well, um, inequality being one. Um, we need to be very thoughtful and, and, and also innovative as we think about these solutions as policymakers in particular um, to, 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 to build momentum, to build societal buy-in. And I think that, you know, how we think about this, we talked about emerging markets, we talked, um, you know, kind of, we could also talk about um, uh, energy or poverty. These are issues we, we potentially can address in a very significant way. I'll talk to you about renewable power and microgrids. I mean, they can democratize energy across the developing world in a way mobile phones have democratized um, communication, um, you know, without the scale of investment that was required to, 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 to get energy um, uh, deployed in, in developed economies. So there's real opportunity in the mix here to think much more broadly um, how we can address some of these challenges. Thank you. So I'd, I'll try to squeeze in one more question. Um, is net zero by 2050 aggressive enough? Uh, how, are, how are we looking to speed this transition up and milestones you've set to track performance? So are we aggressive enough? Um, Opening up. Um, look, if you if you listen to to Greta Thunberg and others, they, there are arguments out that the 2050 isn't aggressive enough. Um, I'm going to defer to scientists. Um, I think they know more than I. But I think what is interesting is that these initiatives are really driving pragmatic real world change. And without them, we won't get there, and we won't even get close. So you know, in this piece of the puzzle, these sort of targets. Once those systems and structures are in place, if we find out it needs to be 2040, like the Amazon Climate Pledge, then you can twist those, those mechanisms to drive further change. But I think what we're doing is you're seeing this mechanism of adding carbon, carbon analysis, carbon forecasting, carbon measuring, carbon targeting to the way that the financial industry operates. Net zero is an incredibly powerful tool to bring that architecture, that infrastructure into life. And then, if, you know, scientists decide it's not enough, then we can, we can accelerate that further. Uh, yeah, what I'd add, Sindhu, is that, I mean, you know, net zero 2050, you know, is consistent with our current knowledge of the science. And I think that putting energy now in to try and shift that forward 10 years, uh, or others back 10 years, is not where the focus should be. This is all about creating momentum in the next five to 10 years. It's about creating the addressable opportunity where we have proven technologies in areas like renewable power generation with plans for balancing the grid. Um, we, and then it's also about investing in new solutions, either new business models, new technologies, and that requires more than private capital. That requires public sector investment so that we can get some of these answers early and begin deploying them earlier. Like I say to you, I think we've hit an inflection point and it's exponential from here, but really it's all about the next five to 10 years, to my mind, if we're going to hit our 2050 target. Thank you. Um, I'll add a question, one of the questions, again, going back to some of the discussions we were having um, and points made by Andy and Richard as well. 
communication to customers. Um, how do you think we can communicate, you know, whether it's metrics or case studies, examples, uh, to make this trustworthy, uh, to bring the power of pensions out to, to our stakeholders? Um, so again, opening up, I don't know, Eva, if you want to come in with, with your thoughts at this point. Yeah, absolutely. Um, this is, I think, a real key challenge for the industry and to balance, you know, the complexity of actually a, a portfolio and the different assets in the portfolio and being able to say this portfolio is net zero aligned or Paris aligned. I think that is a real challenge because there's a drive in the industry to look at measuring portfolio alignment, um, implied temperature ratings to be able to say this portfolio is, you know, a two degree aligned. But there are real concerns around what this doesn't capture. So, for example, you have a portfolio full of climate solutions that help actually decarbonize the rest of the world. And that's not taken into account properly. Um, and the other challenge is different providers will use different methodologies. And we've seen this in a report called the Alignment Cookbook. And actually, you don't have that transparency and comparability. You have the opposite. Um, you might actually have unintended consequences of trying to sell carbon intensive assets so that your portfolio, if you just use that one simplified metrics, looks better and more Paris aligned. So that's a real challenge. Um, so I think you really need a range of metrics and ideally be able to tell the story of how a portfolio supports the net zero transition in the real world, not only carbon, but also looking at green revenues, avoided emissions, you know, the transition assessment alignment we talked about earlier, and almost like a dashboard that tells you that story. But I think it's not as simple as just being able to have a tick box there um, because of where the approach is and the data availability is at the moment. Absolutely, Eva. So, Clive, so you want to come in this on is this? A, this is a topic incredibly close to my heart. When I launched our sustainable fund range, you know, the key to me was how can we illustrate and demonstrate the responsible criteria? You, know, you have an objective for a fund, you demonstrate the investment process, and what's the outcome? Currently, I'm downloading 370 data points per issuer, and we generate a 30-page ESG report. I'm not sure anybody needs a 30-page ESG report, so to be honest, I apologise in advance. But to me, it's you know showing where we are relative. But that has led uh, myself and Invesco to, to actually launch some significant academic research with the ex-head of the CFA in the US and uh, Professor Dimpson of, of Cambridge renowned and, and very well known in ESG circles, to what do clients want in ESG reporting. In return, you get one month, three month, five year data. In risk, you might get drawdown of an investment product or volatility. I'm not sure 360 data points for ESG is, is satisfactory. The paper has a few suggestions uh, and how we can move it forward. But as Eva said, it's you know telling somebody that you've got you know EVIC or capital intent carbon intensity or you've got certain millions of tons. I don't think that resonates with people. So there is a lot of work that needs to be doing to make what is a complex topic digestible and understandable, but importantly standardised and comparable, because there's always a lot of criticism in the markets of what I call nonsense calculators, where you say a thousand pounds in my fund generates, you know, three swimming pools of oil. It sounds great, but how do I compare that from fund to fund and are the mechanisms the same? So a lot of work needs to be done in this area to, to ensure that people believe and understand um, the, the, what a fund delivers. Absolutely. I think that goes back to the, to the central message here in terms of standardization, collaboration and bringing, making everything consistent. Um, thank you to all my panelists today for a really engaging debate. Uh, before I close, can I ask each of you, please, for final thoughts and reflections? Um, Clive, I'd like to start with you, please. Um, well, I think I'm incredibly optimistic about the direction of travel. I think that the collective engagement that you see here between our organisations and the collective organisation that we're going to hear in the next panel of the work of people like Climate Action 100 and Share Action and how they're working together is hugely powerful. And I think what we're seeing is that the incentive structures that capitalism can bring to bear can provide financial incentives as well as the ethical incentive to deliver change. Jim. Look, I think that, you know, the scale of the challenge is now becoming obvious, um, but I think it's really the pace that hasn't been quite internalized yet. 
And I think anyone listening uh, and, and viewing this today really needs to take that on board. And it impacts everyone. And, and everyone has to have a plan. Uh, whether you're an allocator, whether you're an investor, um, you have to have a plan in terms of how you both take advantage of opportunity, but particularly manage the risk. Not just the risks associated with transition, but actually the risks associated with climate change. And so the final bit of advice, which I tend to give to everyone these days, is I'd be very wary about buying anything at sea level on a personal or institutional basis. <laughs> so thank you, Cindy. Thank you very much, Jim. So Eva, your final thoughts, please. Yes, I, I would just highlight um, the importance of that forward-looking view and not just today's view and that we really try to understand the implications of an investment strategy on that real world transition um, and what certain approaches, you know, what, what that would lead to. Um, we need to have a range of metrics that we look at here. We talk about carbon and that's obviously one, but the transition assessment we talked about and the ability to influence their active ownership, you know, all the things we talked about today, it is that, that range of options that we need. Um, and, you know, real world decarbonization is really something that is, it shouldn't just be said so easily, but really is a complex topic that we need to think about. Um, and, and just as a final point, obviously, with COP26 coming up, uh, that we, we really hopefully will see closing a little bit of that ambitions gap and implementations gap to help uh, capital allocation for net zero. Thank you very much, Eva. From my perspective, I've loved the opportunity to share the conversations that we have on a day-to-day -day basis with everyone attending today. I'm confident that through collaboration and collective action, we will decarbonize our investment portfolios and deliver our net zero targets. Thank you very much for joining us for our panel. Thank you, Sindhu, Eva, Jim and Clive for that really insightful debate. I found it particularly interesting to hear the joint problem solving happening live and to understand how we can use the three mechanisms of portfolio design, investment in climate solutions and stewardship to decarbonise our portfolios. It's clear that while significant, significant progress has been made to develop, pilot and roll out leading low carbon aligned investment portfolios, the heavy lifting is yet to come. And we look forward to working with all of our partners across the investment ecosystem to make net zero portfolios a reality. <laughs>